All right. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for today's chat. Um, my name is Brooke Curtis. I'm one of the TA specialists with the Florida PBIS Project, and I am serving uh, districts up in the northeast portion of our state, Clay, Union, Florida School for Deaf and the Blind, and Flagler County is who I serve. And with me today, I've got Kat Rollerson, as well as Dana Absher, um, who are also with us with the project. And today's chat is going to be focusing on integrating positive psychology interventions into your PBIS framework in order to promote well-being. And so our goals for today is for you to hopefully walk away with understanding what we mean by complete mental health and what we know about complete mental health and why incorporating the use of positive psychology interventions helps support complete mental health with your students as well as adults on your campus. We'll also share with you some examples of tier one instruction um, to around positive psychology interventions to integrate within your PBIS framework and things to consider within your tier two and tier three um, systems of support. So what do we mean by complete mental health? And if you've been on our TA chats before or you've visited our website, you may have seen this visual here. And what we are talking about when we mean complete mental health is we're not just looking for the absence of those negative indicators, those things you see there in the blue on the right hand side of the screen, um, reducing those risk factors, um, those trauma, those environmental stressors, or things that perhaps you know and see that your PBIS system is order in is able to impact, excuse me, such as um, impacting disruptive behaviors as defiance or those rule violations, um, the unsafe setting. We know PBIS can have an impact on those. But when we're talking about complete mental health, we're also talking about having an increase or of those positive indicators or those resiliency factors, things like life satisfaction and general happiness, um, things that help impact well-being, such as having gratitude and empathy, um, having those strong social relationships. And we know that students who have complete mental health really have um, high levels or increasing in those positive indicators, as well as the absence or reduction of those negative indicators. And when you have both of those factors, we know that we have better outcomes. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about complete mental health. So when we as um, PBIS implementers, and we assume all of you here today have a basic understanding of PBIS and are working on implementing PBIS at your school. Um, and by joining us today, you're wanting to enhance that system or build up your framework to have more interventions to help support um, students' social, emotional, and behavioral learning. So help building up some of those resiliency factors. And so just kind of to recap, PBIS can be that unifying framework across those 10 critical elements that you see here. And when you put that in that MTSS for mental health, and you think about what we want to do to support students' uh, social, emotional, and behavioral needs, we want to teach the skills that they need, as well as create environments that support well-being. And so PBIS really is that connecting of those two features to support that through your MTSS system. So specifically today, we're going to be looking at those instructional elements and how using those features can really enhance the well-being and happiness within your school system and setting. So why do we want to incorporate those school-based positive psychology interventions into what we do, so into those instructional elements? That's what this graphic here is just kind of demonstrating to you. And as we've shared in previous chats, we know that PBIS can can promote complete mental health through the teaching of skills and integrating those other SEL initiatives. Today, our focus is going to be on those interventions, specifically targeting and promoting those positive emotions, those positive thoughts and behaviors and um, need satisfaction in order to have the outcomes and effects that you see in that last box here to really increase um, well-being, increase those positive emotions, to reduce those emotional problems, have stronger um, peer relations, 
impacting student engagement within the instructional setting and ultimately leading to higher academic achievement. So take just a few moments, if you will, before I turn things over to Kat um, and tell us what's working well for you in your district or school in order to help teach and support those social emotional behavioral skills. And I'm going to turn things over to Kat now. Energies you could use as part of school wide instruction and reinforcement that would enhance, as Brooke said, that well being, life satisfaction, life happiness feature of complete mental health. Um, I, we asked the question of how you're already teaching it um, because some uh, districts or schools that are already using social emotional curriculums along with um, their school wide instruction on expectations and rules and routines do already focus on things that promote happiness. And you'll kind of see that as we go through some of the tier one interventions today. So this is not a new uh, teaching matrix on the slide in front of you, but before we dive into the, the positive psychology intervention approach at tier one, um, just keep to, and you'll, you'll see us repeat through some of these themes a lot, like the complete mental health that we're trying to promote um, through expanding. And then here, we've already talked a lot in chats about how to add on to what you defined or decided to teach in your school-wide framework, like your school-wide expectations, your defined rules by settings, um, and then starting to add in social emotional skills. So in this particular one, like it's not new, but when we bring in positive psychology today, it's an approach to teach some of the features of social emotional learning. So that's why I keep kind of cautioning you, you may already have some curriculums and programs that teach some of the concepts we're gonna go through today, um, but that's where positive psychology adds some uh, field base or research to really focus in on those things to individuals and to settings like schools and classrooms that we know promote happiness or life satisfaction. Um, so the things that you see circled there if we're trying to integrate social emotional skills, uh, the interventions we go through in tier one and Dame will end us off with some considerations for two and three would help promote, uh, be the way we teach those skills. So in that we're gonna focus a lot on teaching skills. In fact, the skills that we know promote happiness and life satisfaction from a positive mindset. Um, we are, this is not a new slide. It's one of ours we like to review and review and show and show and show, but uh, that routine of how we teach skills is, looks just like the academic routine, but we're gonna define our strategies and the way we instruct through our culture and who is um, our context of population and setting that we're dealing with. And I'll go through a couple of different ways of examples of that today. Uh, we want to make sure we're having explicit instruction happening. So if it's a new concept, we want to define and explicitly teach that skill, just like when we roll out our school-wide expectations. We're very explicit in what it is, what it looks like, examples, non-examples. And then that ongoing instruction through showing it, modeling it, providing, uh, practicing, practicing, practicing in the settings that we're going to use it. And the tools or resources we'll go through today in this chat and a little sprinkle of tier one, I uh, will provide you some of those tools to provide that explicit instruction and uh, ongoing practice. Um, and then we'll also just talk about that connection of anything we teach in our school-wide framework, we wanna make sure we're recognizing, acknowledging and reinforcing. Um, that's part of instruction, right? So that we're strengthening it. And the only other uh, pre-concept pre we'll give to where we go into more instructional tools is that we also know schools and districts are always looking at offering instructional tools to promote that, that theory of learning. So if we have a new skill, like we're going to talk about gratitude in a minute, if that's a new skill for me, um, I'm really doing a lot of explicit upfront instruction of what that is so that I can learn that new skill or concept, know what it is. Then we provide uh, routines or instructional activities that just help us practice, like in instructional centers, like where we're practicing to build fluency with that skill until we see the end goal of learning, of course, that we've mastered it, we can use it independently on our own. Um, and in this particular topic today, we can use it when we're feeling uh, either in a frustrating or uh, sad or a, um, really, if we're feeling like it's an abysmal, I'm grouchy today, I'd use some of those strategies on my own because I've maintained them and I have that generalization to use them when I need them. So two things we want you to keep in mind as we add in some supplemental resources you could use from that positive psychology field. Um, and if we didn't say that, uh, which we might have, it's a fairly new field in mental health. Uh, when I say new in the last 10 years has exploded. But um, in the past decade, we had most mental health research coming on how do we reduce that risk that Brooke had reviewed. So we know a lot about reducing risk, but in terms of what uh, therapeutically or um, at tier one, what instructionally can promote well-being and happiness, 
Uh, that's been a new field of study that's gaining steady traction. So there's always new to learn. And I feel like we're giving a little brief snippet of it today, but you'll, you'll leave with some resources where you can learn more or use some of those practices at a tier one level if you'd like to. Um, so the other concept that you already do as PBS implementers is using reward systems of what we teach. Um, we also connect this to it's a uh, positive activity. So celebrations and celebrations of what we see in strengths of others and ourselves is a really nice way to promote good relationships and promote mental well-being. Um, so I know we've been talking with a lot of schools that have had increased stress since the pandemic. And we often talk about the importance of that basic skill of just uh, really specific recognition and feedback. Um, and that we're taking time to celebrate the little small successes that we have, because we know that promotes uh, well-being and, and satisfaction in both our jobs and in um, settings like schools. So keep in mind, just simple celebration and, and keeping in place some of your reinforcement and recognitions are one good way uh, to promote mental health across your campus and mental health well-being. So I'm asking another question, um, and because it is a concept that you should already be doing in PBS implementation, what's been working really well in your districts and schools for reinforcement um, or for just making sure we protect time to celebrate? Because we know that's good for adult well-being as well as kids. So any ideas that you would share or things that you notice that are going really well in terms of reinforcement school-wide um, in your district, if you're a district person, or celebration, like that we're taking times to celebrate small successes. And I think we've been pretty quiet on the chat box front, but if you do have things that you've noticed or recognized, we please, we encourage you to chat those in. And my Florida PBS peeps, that can be stuff that you've seen going really well in schools and campuses in terms of uh, reinforcement systems or just recognizing and protecting time for celebration. Okay, we're gonna use an example as we go through some of the enhancements or add-ons. We uh, had the privilege of visiting as K-8 school, Brooke and I in St. John's County, that's Freedom Crossing Academy. Excellent leadership team, uh, leadership uh, principal, and, and just really good buy-in for not only implementing PBIS, but really doing that integration alignment with social emotional initiatives. For example, use Capturing Kids Hearts was their social emotional initiative. Um, Oh, thank you, Kira. I see that. I'm sorry. I always stop if I ask you to chat in the chat box because I want to capture your thought and practice what I preach. So I see a couple coming in there um, as far as recognition. So Kira, thank you for sharing that. Um, and then keeping in mind that uh, we're adding just not just the verbal recognition, but using pictures. So thanks for sharing that, Kira. Um, and positive phone, phone calls home. You've never uh, used that enough. It's a great strategy. So in this particular school example, um, there are school-wide expectations that we're all familiar with as PBS implementers are imp exemplified there on the FCA. They have safety, they have responsibility, and respectful. Um, I know some of these pictures are a little small, but just to reinforce the concept, they then use that teaching matrix idea and they've defined it, what that looks like by settings. Um, but then they've gone a, a step further. Um, they use a school-wide point system on this campus. It's K through eight. Um, so they use live school points to be part of their token economy. So you can see below, not only do they do what we train in tier one to recognize those expectations and specific examples of what those expectations look like, but they go a little step further in terms of some of those social emotional enhancements, um, some of which model some of the school's positive psychology intervention approaches we're gonna talk about. Um, for example, they adhere to a social contract. So let me show you a picture of that. Part of their um, routines is that they have the students generate and staff generates on the campus what they call a social contract. And that practice is um, promoted through the Capturing Kids Hearts. But the idea is that um, we talk and we do, uh, they often do this through a circle format when they're first creating that. But we, we talk about not only just the rules of the setting, but what makes us successful as learners in that environment and people and uh, family community in that classroom. So you can see some of the words up there exemplify uh, some internalized traits that are, go above and beyond the expectations and rules and routines. Um, but the idea of generating that contract is that we then agree to that, is that we agree to our rules um, and we exemplify that or strive to exemplify that in our family community. So when they have exemplified some of those, they also reinforce those in their school-wide uh, point system or token economy. They exemplify, if they exemplify pieces of the social contract, they reinforce that. Um, and we'll talk about the four questions that's down there in a little bit. And last piece is they use an ongoing routine across classrooms where they do a morning meeting, they talk through um, trying to share good news relative to that social contract. They talk about um, sharing examples of how they've empowered themselves to exemplify that social contract or how they can empower others in their classroom to exemplify that contract. 
And one of the pieces that they do that with in that routine of Excel is that they use a lot of positive language or affirmations. And that fits really nicely um, with the topic for today. So we're going to come back to them a couple of times, but we just want to introduce a couple examples from them first. Um, before we did that, just to exemplify, they do a lot of what we're very familiar with in PBAS with a little bit of enhancements in there. Uh, but keeping with the idea that anything we teach within our framework, we acknowledge or reinforce. So uh, I said we give you a sprinkle of positive psychology intervention background to integrate within your current school-wide instruction approach. So as a field, I think I've said this a couple of times, but we're focusing on those traits of individuals that we know promote uh, resilience and well-being and happiness. Um, and teaching those through um, experience level. And I'll kind of unpack the visual there. And we are stealing a lot of information we use today, uh, politely stealing because we love them, uh, from the school psych research team and from Dr. Shannon Soldo. She's done a lot of great statewide presentations on this. She's one of our local experts at USF, um, among others that are referenced there below, um, that have kind of set up this way to approach some of the tier one or class, uh, school-wide classroom, right? approaches of positive psychology. So we know that we can foster this positive emotions or happiness. You're focusing on the skills you see there that um, reflect on past experience. So if you focus on gratitude and forgiveness, that's reflecting on past experience in a cognitive reframe light uh, that promotes well-being and happiness. Present experience, the two you see listed there, we're going to cover some resources for you that focus on how doing those for example, acts of kindness help, help in the present moment to promote positive emotions in ourselves and in our environments, um, as well as identifying the strengths in ourselves and others is another one we'll talk about. And then the other piece is future experience. So when we look ahead to the future, focusing on skills of optimism and hope for future um, are supported by the field to really promote that life satisfaction and hope for future. So we're looking at promoting what Brooke introduced us with, that life satisfaction and happiness through these activities focused at reflection on past experience, present experience, and future experience. Um, and I, I probably said it twice already, but I don't wanna forget my disclaimer here that just take into account that some of the curriculums, if you are using curriculums for social emotional learning, there's a lot of overlap here. And some of them do teach some of these concepts. Um, one I exemplified there is MindUp, if you're familiar with it, but there are others. So as I go through now, some instructional resources for you to integrate or use to uh, foster these things in past and present and future. Um, just keep in mind, you might also have other instructional tools on your campus. So gratitude, when we think about past experience, one thing, one skill we can teach that we know is a really protective factor of individuals is having a gratitude approach and being thankful. Um, and we just got a lot of practice of that in November for Thanksgiving, but even doing, we mean expanding outside of just Thanksgiving time, um, individuals, we know from research that have a good level of gratitude and really have a thankful approach for things in their life, uh, really protects them. It's a coping skill. It makes them healthier at coping when they're in a frustrating situation or if they're having to overcome a frustrating situation. Uh, we know fostering that skill and, and generalizing mastering gratitude is something that can protect us a lot as an individual. We know that practicing it in school environments helps make that environment even more um, strong at promoting mental well-being and happiness. So in the following slides, when we talk about the skill, what we've offered you is a couple examples. They're not the end all be all, just to give you, to let you leave with one example of how you could integrate that in. Um, and we're trying to exemplify that concept of learning where we're trying to explicitly teach first, just like we do with our school at expectations, and then promote uh, ongoing practice until we've mastered that. So here on the left, you can see, and anytime you see a lesson or a picture, we provided you the link so you can directly pull that tool if you want to use that. Um, or it might prompt you to think of other tools that you use or that your schools use already. Um, but we are focused at that tier one level, so ways we could sprinkle in. Uh, you see here on the left, that's a little bit of our earlier childhood example or elementary example. So we're taking that idea of unpacking the concepts. We're gonna unpack gratitude by linking it to happiness. Uh, for younger students, that often helps because gratitude is a big term and defining what it means. Uh, we, here, we explicitly teach it by having us think about what makes us happy and why. Um, and that's a really important piece of gratitude is not just what is it, but why does it make us, why are we thankful for it? What's impacting our lives that helps us? Um, so here in this routine, you can start with just unpacking the term, what is it? And then we start to practice it um, by some movement and going around and telling other students what makes us happy and why and listening to them tell us why they're happy and why or what makes them happy and why. So a little bit of ongoing practice where the teacher can provide some feedback. 
Then going a step further, you can have them draw about it if we're not quite to writing degree yet. Um, or if we have kids with disabilities that can't do a lot of our writing, we could draw about it or tell someone about it and they could help us draw or write sentences for us. For um, other ideas, we'd be drawing that picture and illustrating and then writing about what makes us happy in terms of happiness being that gratitude. Uh, this lesson plan also follows them with kindness examples from books that you could extend that learning or use in literacy because a really nice way to teach, right, is modeling through characters and we'll come back to that idea. So just to extend on the concept, we told you we'd offer you a couple examples. On the right is a little bit more of an older, uh, all the way up to young adult or adulthood example of a routine, or excuse me, lesson plan with a routine. So um, it gives nice guidance as far as when we build gratitude, it's really helpful as we can be as specific as possible. So again, not just why, what we're thankful for, who we're thankful for, but why. Um, we know if we practice that a lot, we start to get really good at not only practicing that when we need to, to help turn our mindset around, um, but we start to access our social support better, which is something we want everyone to do. Um, we're working on Wendell Baby. If I'm stressed, I know who to go to because I've been thankful for them before for that help, or I know I need to take more breaks because that helps me. So just extending that idea, there's another routine that's a little bit older focused um, and focusing more on just that idea of gratitude journaling. Um, I know my planner right now is a gratitude journal, so this practice is fairly popular and you'll see it everywhere. And it's because we know this is such a good habit to get into. Um, and then we added in your handouts. Uh, there's not a link for that top one, but just a way to keep practicing that uh, is in the gratitude journal page that you see where you have kind of four ways that you're going to start uh, really sending or practicing that grateful concept, getting really specific like we recommended uh, to promote the best bang for your buck. Uh, but all these examples, super fast. You can make them quicker if you want. So it's an intervention because it's a way to provide instruction on an expanded skill of gratitude that we know is good for well-being, um, but could be really quick within your instructional day. Um, and you could use it in all kinds of existing uh, pieces of your instructional routine or day. Uh, so that's one example. The other one we wanted to add to gratitude is when we do ongoing practice. Um, and what, what research has found from positive psychology is that when we initially start to practice gratitude, we have a lot of good impacts on happiness up to a month after you did that practice. Um, but we know that regular intervals of keeping it going, like our habits that we get into, um, can expand that happiness and make it even stronger of an impact. So these are more of that expanded practice. So not only can we journal as an expanded practice, but we could do a, what's called gratitude letter. And we gave you um, an example of that. Um, as far as how to write a gratitude letter, if I was an older student that was writing that, or I could draw a picture in a letter. Uh, this routine ends with this idea of visits, because that's what's on the right. Um, we know that not only ourselves practicing what we're thankful, but then conveying that gratitude to others is a great way to build positive climate and well-being in your setting. So we were just talking about this on another social media post um, where we used to have an example of students who were reading letters of why they were thankful for an adult in the building. Um, and what they did that helped them to be successful. And they read those letters to individuals. That's spot on with, you see what's in the lesson plan here. Or if you have a younger population you're working with, I'm um, just having them plan out a gratitude visit. And it could be around your campus, it could be to students, or it could be at home, like you see in this example. Um, and it's just taken straight from that well-being promotion that I referenced in the beginning, that you identify people who are especially kind or helpful, and then just plan the logistics of how that visit could happen. Um, but the visit idea takes that a step further than just me writing down and practicing what I'm grateful for and expands that a little bit more as well as strengthens the impact of it because we're practicing that fairly regularly. So first examples were about how to teach it and how to practice it. And this extends out a little bit more with ways you could do that ongoing practice across the campus um, with that idea of gratitude visits taking it a step further. The other pa past focus skill that we mentioned was forgiveness. So um, we know that when students and adults actually practice forgiveness, uh, it will replace the emotion of anger when we forgive. Um, this is definitely, of all that we covered today, one of the most complicated skills. So I caution you a little bit there because forgiveness, especially with our early childhood friends and up to adolescents, we're starting to learn the skills of compassion and empathy and how to forgive. So it's, um, and I was telling uh, Brooke and Damon this, I'm guilty of being like, hey, you apologize to him because I'm so mad at whatever my son did. And I have to be patient on, he may not be ready for that forgiveness skill, but to start to understand his impact he had on for doing that, things like restorative practices that a lot of you use, like what impact that caused and how I can repair that. 
um, really helps promote that skill of forgiveness. And we know that the act of forgiveness, which is why we're showing you lesson plans or ways to practice that, uh, really promotes well-being and healthy coping, um, as well as replaces unhealthy emotions like anger and frustration. So two examples here for you on forgiveness. Um, one is just a routine that you go through to um, individually practice that. Um, and you see how it, it models compassion as part of the skills of forgiving. I have to be compassionate and think of others with that empathy to be able to forgive. Um, another one on the right is a little more simple modeling. So in a literacy lesson, we could use books to model forgiveness through characters. And I'm a huge fan of that because I just said this is one of the big complex skills, especially for our little guys who are starting to learn uh, right and wrong consequences. Uh, so here you could model through with characters. Uh, what did they forgive? Why do they forgive? Um, in what way do they find it difficult to forgive? Because it's a nice way to have them think through and reflect on their own of that piece. And we'll come back to this one a little bit um, with reflecting on future too and, and what that means in terms of discipline responses. Um, so two links there for you. I'm going to check my times and we're already running a tiny bit late uh, with our entry, but we're doing pretty good. I'm excited about that. So if those were past focused. If you remember the organization of instructional like enhancements from positive psychology or tier one interventions, but there's past focus, which was gratitude, forgiveness, and now we're in present focus. And this is one that I think super, I see this in lots of schools already. I don't even know if they know they're doing it because it just promotes well-being or if we just do it to be kind because it's a value. Um, but when we think about kindness in any school, some of our schools have been kind as a school-wide expectation already. Um, this one's a really easy one to integrate in there. If, if you're if being kind is not one of your school-wide expectations, it's just an enhancement you make where we practice kindness. Um, and on the right is an example of random acts of kindness and how you could um, exemplify that. But one important takeaway take from that tool is it really doesn't matter uh, the amount of time. It doesn't have to be a super intense act of kindness, just simple things um, like the next one we'll talk about, recognizing strengths of others or helping someone who's having difficulty with uh, or needs a pencil and you hand them a pencil. Little, little acts of kindness can build up to promote that well-being. Um, but what is kindness is, is the part of explicit peace and then how we um, conduct that. And then I'll talk about the right-hand side in a minute So come back to FCA or freedom crossing. Um, the other piece there is acts of kindness don't necessarily, the person you're doing them for, they don't have to know that. Um, so think about, uh, and this always happens on the best days for me, but when someone paid, if I'm in a Starbucks line and someone in front of me paid for me. They did that randomly. Um, and I do know that, but I didn't necessarily, they didn't have to see me know that. They didn't have to know that I knew they did it. Just them doing it on their own of paying for someone was a kindness that, that really elicits positive emotions for that person who's conducting the act of kindness. So throw kindness around like confetti, as you see from FCI, FCA, excuse me. I would come back from that school I showed you at the beginning, just to kind of keep using some of their examples of how they're doing this. Um, they have, uh, you see up top how they explicitly teach what kindness is um, and give lots of examples and non-examples. Um, and then what they did after they did that lesson is they focused on them. And then across their campus, they actually do what's called random acts of kindness that you see on the little uh, metal file cabinet there where it has uh, acts of kindness that we could uh, either take one and use that or pick from and use that. But also we use that to reinforce acts of kindness that have happened in the classroom or the school. Um, and the last one, just a simple example of a kindness tree where we're using that school-wide reinforcement to uh, call out acts of kindness, whether that's something I did that was kind and I put my heart on the tree or that I recognize that someone did for me that was kind. So just a way to take that idea we already talked about in PBIS of once we teach something, we reinforce it and um, recognizing that in their school-wide uh, system. And then just, again, unique to FCA is that's part of their like social contract and that Excel routine that they use that really comes back to kindness was usually part of their social contract that they committed to in the classroom. So that's acts of kindness, pretty straightforward. Oh, before I leave that, Therese, I think I asked you to put in the chat box. There's actually right at the same time, a really nice, uh, um, oh, she already did it, I think. I'm so sorry. It's there, Kat, yep. And Therese is good. So there is a grant opportunity out right now that came out at a perfect time for this chat that if you are already doing, like FCA, I'm gonna be sharing that with them, um, a lot of expansion of your PBS system on kindness. That link that she posted there, I would take a look at that. Um, it's an open opportunity to get some funding on your expansion and also gives another nice example of how we would integrate teaching kindness and looking for kindness in our school-wide system. 
So take a look at that link. It just came in a really nice time. Um, does have some requirements on population and demographics, but we encourage you to take a look at it, if not just for the resources that were in the application. Okay, so as we move, um, we're going to continue with present focus and then present focus. Another one we talked about is identifying and recognizing strengths and selves and in, in ourselves and others. So PBIS familiar, right? Um, we teach squad expectations, we look for them, we reinforce them um, across our campuses. That's looking for strengths in others. Uh, for ourselves, we make sure to do it for ourselves. And these are our integration reminders that um, we wanna make sure if we ever bring in new strengths that we're recognizing, just like FCA's examples, that we're aligning to the school-wide expectations. So you've probably seen that little visual there, we've shown it multiple times, but where they take those concepts of other things they're gonna teach on the campus and link it to their expectation, we encourage you to make that connection in schools that are expanding to teach other skills or strengths that we're gonna recognize. Um, so for FCA, that social contract was an expansion of their school expectations and they linked it to their reinforcement system and made sure um, they had some nice procedures for how they were going to implement that and use it in everyday instruction. Then we always want to connect it to our reinforcement system. I think I've said that multiple times if I sound like a broken record. Um, but recognizing strengths in ourselves and our others and a lot of these activities we're talking about are, are tier one interventions or um, naturally reinforcing because they're going to promote good emotions and make us feel good, um, which is usually reinforcing to people. And then I said we'd come back to FCA's four questions. Um, the other part we're going to start moving into a little bit as we cover these last couple is um, practicing that trait when we do have a difficulty. So if students have a tough day or have situationally inappropriate or behavioral error, um, if staff is having a rough day or high stress, um, they have a consistent response of those four questions um, that prompt self-reflection and have the students think about what, what can I do to fix the problem? Um, and they rely on that social contract and some of these skills they've taught to help be how they're going to fix that problem or what they're gonna do about it. Um, and we'll keep going on that idea a little bit when we talk about uh, some of the last traits and in, in future focused. So in terms of present focused, you don't have to do a survey. Um, I, I really appreciate my colleague bringing that up. And one of the things like, do I have to take a survey? You definitely don't. We just wanted to offer because there's a great field and wealth of surveys out there to recognize strengths in individuals. So I'm giving you these strictly in case um, you would like to use a survey. Um, and that Penn Authentic Happiness website is amazing as far as if you want to build your knowledge base of positive psychology in general. Um, there are some great free tools out there that, that allow you to serve, not just to survey to see what your own strengths are, um, which can be very helpful if you do my adolescent groups, like adolescents we know self-esteem starts to become an issue. So someone taking a survey can help make that more concrete for me because I can't recognize my own strengths. So surveys can be helpful there. Um, but also when we do strengths, we can link them to like the authentic happiness that you see on the right. It links taking the survey to some instructional activities then, um, like giving face-to-face -face interviews where the, the students get to practice with each other, where they talk about their own strengths from the interview. You don't have to use the interview there, but it would give you, or excuse me, the survey there. But in that routine, it pairs the taking of the survey with how we use that information. Um, and then you could pair it with a writing assignment. So you at the bottom there, like how can we write about our strengths now that we've learned those about ourselves? Like how can we uh, write a little bit about how those can be um, important to us and help in promoting future success? So just ideas, you don't have to use the surveys. To extend on that idea of identifying our own strengths, um, the, from those same organizations, the VIA character, like I said, is a great one if you want to take a look at it. Um, there's an activity without the survey, but just where we practice, what do you look like at your best? Um, so if we're trying to promote a positive emotion, happiness, well-being in present day right now, great activity to use is having them practice to think of when were you at your best? Uh, what's a time when you're really exemplifying or expressing those qualities that you're really proud of about yourself? Um, if you took the survey, they could be linked to the survey. If not, just your, you could be on your school wide expectations. When did you really exemplify kindness or respect for others? Um, you could change that to be geared towards the school-wide expectations to be even a clearer connection to our PBIS implementation. Um, so just writing about that idea. And then on the right is one directly from that well-being promotion that we referenced, uh, the strength superhero for little ones, uh, making it into a superhero. So for white adolescents, the, the left example may work really well. On the right, uh, making it a little more fun or uh, earlier development, uh, although I, I think we enjoyed practicing this as adults, we used it in one of our staff meetings, what's your superhero strength? What does it look like? Give it a name, draw it, 
um, show how at the bottom, it's always going to be about not just the strength, but how is it going to work for you in the future? Um, so if it's humor, which that's probably one of the strengths I would consider of the presentation team today, but humor, how does it help others? It helps people laugh. It helps people take their idea of stress when they're sad. Um, my friends enjoy laughing, things like that. So it connects not only to the strength, but what I can then do for others with that strength in the community. And then back to K through eight FCA, they use uh, their, their vision is based on breaking barriers. So the words posters that you can't see great, but you can see a couple of them from their social contract, they take their words and either post strengths that they have or a word maybe they're working on for the next week. I wanna be really uh, confident next week. I'm gonna work on my confidence. So it's kind of this way they take the social contract and use it to keep monitoring themselves on it, adults and kids, and then track that they, they do have that improvement so that we can focus on um, acknowledging those strengths in the classroom. Okay, and then recognizing strengths in others. So uh, one of the pieces of uh, present focus positive emotions is that we recognize not only our own strengths, but that is important, so don't forget yourself, but strengths in others. So this could not be more related to that positive specific feedback we talk about in school-wide reinforcement. Um, so making sure that we are um, not just recognizing a, an example strength of a coworker, for example, my coworkers on this uh, presentation team and tech team were very supportive planning this and today when no one could get in the room. Um, and I was really thankful that they are so supportive in nature because it really helped get this chat started and get people in the room, which was really important to the success of it. Um, so this activity real quick, and I encourage you to use this in a staff meeting uh, or a department meeting with adults quick way to really foster well-being that you're promoting, uh, not only that you recognize strengths in your coworkers or, or uh, climate, excuse me, school family, but why that strength's important and what they do. Because um, that type of positive uh, specific feedback, we cannot underestimate the power of enough. Um, so just like school-wide reinforcement, but it could be brought into some of the strengths we've already talked about in those surveys or in things like uh, uh, broader examples of just the school-wide expectations. Okay, and then taking us, wrapping us up before Dima ends us with some considerations in tier two, you can kind of see how the past, current, and now future are all pretty simple as far as I said, sprinkling. <laughs> Things that you can sprinkle into school ed instruction and then promote that ongoing practice with um, that aren't too hardcore, but just we know have a lot of impact if we practice them regularly. So in future focused, um, that is looking at that we are promoting hope or optimism for the future. Um, so some activities that do that, again, on the left, we're taking from uh, the well-being group that Shannon shared in many presentations across the state, but where we're looking at things like what's our best possible self, not just now, but in the future. Um, so it builds a lot of hope. If you think about yourself, if you've ever been in a really tough call, like the shutdowns, for example, we're all in shutdown. Um, when you can think about the future and how you are going to be better in the future, it instantly starts to change your mindset and, and make you feel more positive along with the next step that you see is what steps am I going to take to get there? Um, goal setting has been around forever, right? In, in education and learning and behavior change. If I set a goal and I work towards that goal, um, I have a likelihood of meeting that goal. And that all builds, uh, achieving goals builds positive emotions and well-being in life. Um, so we can use that simple activity. Um, they also offer a homework assignment there that you can keep working on that. On the right, um, I just wanted to link it to the responses we use in a classroom when there are situationally inappropriate behavior or behavioral errors that occur. Um, I always say I love any strategy that's gonna promote reflection or um, of course reteaching is part of that. It's gonna promote that approach of what did I do wrong and how can I fix it for the next time? Um, it's gonna help me learn from the experiments but instantly starts to build that hope for the future and optimism that I can change my behavior um, I always talk about this with my youngest son because he, he'll say like, I'm, oh, that was bad. And I always say, there are, you know, you're, there's no bad kids. There's only bad choices that we make. And those are things we can fix, right? Those are things that we can change. And that instantly changes your framework to if someone just tells you, you know, you, you, you have been a bad kid or um, you're bad for the school. Anytime that language is used, it instantly takes away our hope for the future and makes us feel defeated. So the other one I would connect here without giving, I don't have the time to commit to explain it, but the restorative practices approach that our project's been working on, not only in proactive and prevention, but in response, uh, would definitely fit there as far as aligning with uh, promoting that hope and integration for the future. 
So that wraps up the tier one sprinkling. Uh, you're going to be saying sprinkling now all day. Uh, some simple things from the past, present, and future that you could use from the field that you could enhance what you currently do in your framework to teach, reinforce, acknowledge, um, gratitude, forgiveness, um, along with some of those responses that we use, recognizing strengths, keeping that going in a reinforcement system, and then how we promote uh, hope and optimism for the future. Um, so I know uh, it seems small, but those are quick things you could take away to start with um, and expand into your one that would promote wellness for not only the kids in a building, but an adults. And I'm going to have Dana wrap us up with tier two and three considerations um, with our existing couple minutes we have left, Dana. All right. Thanks, Kat. And thanks, everyone, for hanging with us. Um, just as a reminder, integrating that positive, um, the positive psychology practices within your tier one system is a great way to promote mental wellness for all. So in the spirit of sprinkling a little bit more information, we're going to briefly touch on some considerations for how you can implement those positive psychology interventions at tier two and three. Um, so as we move to the next slide, remember tier two includes supplemental supports, tier three, those are the more intensive and individualized supports. So the purpose of tier two and a tiered support system is to supplement the core of tier or tier one. So let's think about considerations for integrating the previously reviewed positive psychology skill building within things such as your check-in, check-out um, interventions in small group instruction interventions or within your social emotional skill curriculum, such as you see here, we've got reference to Mind Up. Um, there's also a link there to a free social emotional group resource. So just to think, you know, shifting gears from that tier one framework kind of mindset of things that we're gonna integrate within that, that system for all, now we're shifting into how we can incorporate those practices and those ideas and the positive psychology skill building within what we're already doing with check-in, check-out and those small group um, instruction interventions. Remember one more um, key point to think about is when we provide supplemental instruction, we also check progress toward tier one expectations more often. Um, one common recommended format for doing this is with a daily progress report. So you'll see there a sample daily progress report um, is linked in the slide there just to use as an example. And we really want to encourage folks to, to see how this fits nicely within your current practices. And it really only involves a few intentional um, shifts in, in what you're doing, what you're teaching, and how you're encouraging those um, positive practices within your tier two groups with students. We wanted to note an extension of the interventions mentioned today. Kat shared a lot of information um, and how we can promote those things within tier one. Those um, practices that she mentioned and the work that Dr. Soldo has done, um, those are some proven interventions with effectiveness from third through 12th grade. And um, there's a link at the bottom of this slide for the manual and more information. If you'd like to look into this more, um, if you're looking for tier two group interventions to supplement and teach coping skills for building life satisfaction and well being, the well being promotion program is definitely one you're going to want to look at and see how you can fit that within what you're doing. Um, on your campus. And we listed some of the details for implementation just so you can reference. Um, you'll see a lot of things that CAT covered, um, a lot of familiar terms and um, targeted things that can be taught through the Wellbeing Promotion Program. So just another nice way to enhance um, what you're doing at Tier 1 and make sure that's integrated and aligned across Tier 2. And if you're a mental health clinician or district leader that supports clinicians, um, merging cognitive behavioral evidence-based tier three interventions includes considering your current continuum of support at tier three first. Um, tier three intensity and interventions involves using expanded data sources, such as clinical interviews um, would be one example, but also um, this includes expanding your team members. For example, clinicians and behavioral staff members are really key folks to have involved on your team when you are looking at implementation of tier three practices and interventions and decision rules. 
We encourage continuing a strengths-based approach with individualized intervention plans and expanded teams. Um, this is going to promote individual needs and help with wraparound services, support person-centered planning, things like that, um, that are really essential when you get into that more intensive, individualized um, support provided to a smaller percentage of students on your campus. At tier three, positive psychology interventions could support replacement skill instruction through individualized counseling focused on coping skills to overcome symptoms of depression. Those are things that could be impacting school success and relationships for students. So it's really about connecting those intensive and individualized practices and um, replacement skill building and skill instruction, connecting that across your um, overall goals within your um, multi-tiered system of support. If you're a clinician attending today, you'll see a link here for an evidence-based approach that you might want to take a look at. If you're not a clinician, you'll probably want to share this with your clinician friends or just send the link once this is recorded or even just the link to that um, resource to take a look at. For more information on a tier three continuum of supports, you can view a summary table at the live binder link, and that's provided as a PDF handout with today's materials. We know this has been a lot of information um, and we appreciate you guys going through some of the technical glitches to start with. Uh, more re resources can be referenced on selecting evidence-based interventions for well-being promotion and integrating and aligning with your PBIS framework in our live binder. Um, you'll see a link there and some things that are highlighted that you might want to take a look at. And we also encourage you to join us for our next TA chat. And I believe our next one in January is looking at student voice in your PBIS framework. Um, our students are very important stakeholders in all of the things we do, and um, they are basically our why. So you definitely want to join us for that. And then we're going to put the satisfaction survey poll. I'm going to launch that now. Thank you. Listen, while you're doing that, Dema, thank you. We really would appreciate your feedback. Um, this, the chat materials uh, Therese posted, they will eventually be posted in the integrated positive psychology tab as well. They're not yet. Um, and right now our two older chats, we did have some uh, chats that were done a while ago that have um, some more information um, that are there for you. But I appreciate you pulling up the poll. Yes, thank you. And you all, please feel free to give us some feedback on um, the information shared today. Let us know if we met your needs and anticipated goals for today. Um, and follow us on social media. Please connect with us, share the good practices that you're doing. Um, and if anything comes from today and you implement some um, great strategies across any of the tiers or have any clinicians um, on that want to share with us what you're doing or how you're using this information uh, to take back to your school or district, that would be great. We love seeing what you're doing with the information. Um, and I can't see the poll. Is the poll up, Dema? It may just be me. I see it. I did not launch it. Um, so okay. thank you. <laughs> yep, it, it is up. Um, I think, Kat, you cannot see it because you're in presentation mode. Okay, cool. And I don't need to see it as long as it's up. Um, <laughs> Kira Hoffman, I saw your, we do have time for a question. You're welcome to unmute or to ask it in the chat box. I was just going to say, we, we thank you for your time and listening today and um, bearing with us through some of the tech challenges. And then we will stay for questions that you have. So go ahead, Kara, you can either unmute or you can type it in the chat box. Hey, yeah, I'd much rather speak because it'll take too long to type. Um, I was wondering about the, the tier two and the tier three, how that works. Um, in relation to MTSS, because we have several scholars that we have on some behavior um, behavior plans, but they're not necessarily to the point where we need to put them in tier two for behavior in MTSS. So when I'm looking at um, you know putting together everything to see what we're doing for our tier one, our tier two, tier three, as far as PBIS goes, does it have to be MTSS that they're in to be considered tier two? Does that make sense? Um, so when you say that, I'm gonna unpack your question a little bit. So when you say that, do they have to be an MTSS? That makes me think you mean your process and procedures in your district maybe? 
Yeah, so we have the MTSS for the students when they, when they need interventions, we yep. put them on these plans and it's based, it's like official. Um, so, yeah. so that becomes their tier two. And then if they need further, they go into tier three, but I didn't, so with the overlap of PBIS having tier one, tier two, tier three, I didn't know if they were in relation to each other. Yes. So that's why I was clarifying your question. So when we okay. put PBS as a three-tiered framework, it is a multi-tiered system of support. Right. But I think right. your question about your process and procedures, it, it sounds like the answer is going to be more of an internal district answer. But um, it, when we talked about tier two supports like Damages did, mm -hmm. um, and we talked about the tier one, the tier one enhancements we talked about, not all schools would enhance their tier one with those features. So that's part right. of the question is like, what, what is our tier one and what's the response to it? Right. Um, when we identify kids that may need small group intervention, usually that means they're, they're being identified for tier two support within a multi-tiered system. So I was trying to think through when you said, um, would they have to be formally on tier two to get a group? or um, was maybe maybe not understanding the question as much, but I, if we're putting them in a group like the one that Dame had given an example of, that, that would be a formal tier two intervention. Right. Group. The other strategies that we covered though, in the middle were around the tier one instructional practices that you could use, or instructional interventions you could use in classrooms and school-wide for tier one. Um, so it would not necessarily have to be tracked. It's something you're doing to promote better outcomes overall on your campus. Does that sure. make sense? Total. Dama or Brooke, anything to add with that question? No. I, I was just going to add, this is Brooke. Kara, I think I saw that you're from Clay County. If you could type what school, I'll be sure to follow up with Christy Gomez, your district coordinator, to help answer any further questions around that. Even better. I should have let Brooke go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Kara, for the question. Okay, were there other questions or comments? I would just like to say, ladies, you were amazing. Um, talk about starting under pressure. So <laughs> way to knock it out of the park. Um, unfortunately, with all of the hubbub, uh, the recording, I did not get it started until maybe 15 minutes in. So I missed Brooke's introduction. Mm -hmm. So Brooke, if you're able to maybe record your part, um, I could try to marry it with Kat's part. <laughs> that way we have a complete video without having to redo the entire chat. Okay. <laughs> you can do it even better, Brooke. You can do it even better. I, I, I plan on it. <laughs> <laughs> Brooke, I thought you were good. <laughs> what a hard way to start a chat. Um, but you, you ladies rose to the occasion, so way to go. Yep, we can do that. And um, I just was noting some of the resources people said in the chat. I apologize if I didn't attend when I was talking about, about that. Bounce Back um, is a great approach. It's a clinical program that's nice for, especially for trauma exposure. So I like that reference. And so lots of good examples of others using the practices. So take a look at those in the chat box. But th I guess I'll just say thank you. We appreciate everyone. Brooke, I appreciate you re-recording the beginning. <laughs> and Me too. <laughs> Um, we will hang out for another minute or two if there's any other questions or comments, and otherwise we'll, we'll post that beautiful connected recording when it's time. Oh, thanks, Karen and Nicole. Oh, good. I'm glad we are doing. That's great. Ladies, can I can I just ask you a question? It's sure. Martine here from, from Victoria in Australia. Um, one of the things that, that I've found is that, and this might be different in, in Florida, that there's a little bit of competition between, you know, like, are you a pos psych school or are you a PBIS school? Do you have that happening or is it is it very aligned? Ooh. Great question. Um, I wouldn't say there's a competition, but I would say there's um, some misunderstanding of not only positive psych and PBS, but like uh, any social emotional learning initiatives or curriculums that come in. And sometimes for multiple reasons, people think you have to do one or the other. And so that's why you see us kind of, when we were talking about repeat slides, we do that on purpose because we want you to see it doesn't have to be either or, it can be 
and, and that's usually the best for kids when you have the and. So that's my observations, Dama and Brooke. I don't know if you have other observations. I would agree with that. I, I was starting to type that it's often, what I find is it becomes a competition for resources. True. So the, the people who are those content experts within each of those areas, whether it's positive psych, PBIS, or SCL are really competing for resources. And so to Kat's point, that's why we really try and focus on where is that integration and how can we align so that we can we can share and ultimately have those positive outcomes for all students because each initiative has that same goal in mind. Yeah, I like that point too. Yeah, yeah that makes really good sense. Um, and I think in your first slide where you're talking about, about or one of the early slides about it, PBIS being a unifying framework, I know that Harry and I were on a different thing. We just go, oh, unifying framework. That's such a great way to put it. Um, but we definitely have schools who go, look, yes, we were a PBIS school, but we're going to be a pos psych school now because mm. it's less intensive for them. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we just have to sort of go like both things that are trying to really impact on student well-being so go for it um so yeah, just was interested I, in what you have happened agree yeah and I, i'm a big fan of promoting like Brooke was saying about the the common goal like what are the goals because both approaches support those goals and we know that integrating them together is going to give us the best thing for our buck so it's usually hard to argue when you start having those conversations but the competing of resources like Brooke just said i think happens a lot when we don't understand the other the other what if it's positive psych or if it's pbis so um, we are looking in Florida. I feel like sometimes we can start with like what you were listening in. Anyone listening in, as we know, already, we kind of always say we're assuming you're already an active implementer. So you're already implementing PBIS. So that gives them a one leg up. I mean, they've already started that and they know that. So to connect to their framework is easier to do than maybe a school just starting out or a school that's uh, more familiar with positive psych, for, to use your example, than PBIS. Those awesome. Great point. That's great. I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yes, and resources, time and attention. Yeah, that's great, ladies. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you.